Good evening, everybody. Welcome. Welcome to the AIA Archaeology Hour. My name is Ulrika Krocek. I am here from the Puget Sound chapter of the Archaeological Institute of America to introduce our speaker and um, these, this series. Um, the Archaeological Institute of America is the oldest and largest professional organization for archaeologists, both professional ones and also just people who are interested in archaeology. We have lots of programs and publications to keep you up to date with archaeological research and discoveries, and we, um, uh, which include Archaeology Magazine, uh, which is all things archaeological news, the new and the exciting, and then the more scholarly American Journal of Archaeology. And you can have access um, to these publications and many other things, um, such as participating in excavations, attending an event such as an International Archaeology Day, um, finding local societies, or even going on AIA tours by joining the Archaeological Institute of America. You can do this by scanning this code or by going to this link right here. And Rachel will also drop the link into the chat. One of some of the benefits um, in, of this membership include an eligibility for AIA awards and grants, affiliation with a local society, discounts on tours and registrations. And I'll add here that membership, annual membership for students starts as low as $30 a year. It's a great deal. Um, and you get lots and lots of stuff for it. Uh, you can also support us by giving donations by scanning the link right here or going to archeological.org slash donate. This is the Archaeology Hour series, and this is our second talk of the series with Dr. Ann Austin, and here you see past and future series. Um, this academic year running through the winter and into the spring, and we invite you to come to many other of these excellent lectures. Uh, just a quick warning that um, this presentation will show images of human remains. And we'll also talk about that. And then I'm going to take one quick minute to give a plug for the Puget Sound Archaeology, Archaeological Institute of America Society. We have two important events coming up, an International Archaeology Day that's this Sunday at the Burke Museum in Seattle. It is free from 10 to 3. Bring the whole family. It's going to be super fun. The focus is on Pacific Northwest archaeology. And then the other is more of an ongoing event, and that is we offer a series of micro grants to students, undergraduates and high school students alike who are interested in or participating in some archeological venture um, and need a little bit of a financial bump. And you can see our website that Rachel will drop into the, um, into the chat for this and other, um, and other opportunities and talks. So we are here today um, to talk to with and to listen to Ann, Dr. Ann Austin. Um, stay tuned for our next lecture, uh, which will be with Catherine Chu um, in November um, about ancient Peru. But I will take a minute to um, introduce Dr. Austin. Dr. Austin received her BA in anthropology from Harvard and her MA and PhD from UCLA in archaeology. She joined the University of Missouri-St. Louis in 2017 after completing a three-year postdoc at Stanford University in the History Department. Her research combines the fields of osteology and Egyptology in order to document medicine and disease in the past. Specifically, she uses data from ancient Egyptian human remains and daily life texts as the site of Deir el Medina to reconstruct ancient Egyptian healthcare networks. Her current research project focuses on the practice of tattooing in ancient Egypt and its potential connections to gender, religion, and medicine. Her work at Dera El Medina has identified more tattooed ancient Egyptians than at any other site in Egypt, allowing for new perspectives on the role of tattooing in ancient Egyptian daily life. So with a reminder to please not record, please join me in welcoming um, uh, Dr. Ann Austin. Thank you so much. I'm very happy to be here with all of you virtually today. I'm excited to share with you this topic. It is one that I've been studying since 2014. 
And we're going to return to this image of a woman's tattoos on her thighs later on in the presentation. But first, I actually want to start with talking about tattoos today. So the problem with a virtual lecture is I can't see who is here right now. I can't see your beautiful faces. I don't know what our audience looks like, but I can imagine that you decided to be here virtually with me today because you might be interested in archeology span in general, you might be interested in ancient Egypt, or you might be interested in tattooing. I can imagine that this audience contains a huge range of age groups with teenagers and octogenarians alike. And if I could see you all right now, I'm betting I would see people who are heavily tattooed and people who could never imagine getting a tattoo in their life. In 2015, a Harris poll of Americans asked millennials, Gen Xers, baby boomers, and the silent generation if they had one or more tattoos. And you can see this huge generational divide in tattooing. At that time, almost the majority of millennials have tattoos, while only 10% of the silent generation did. And this generational divide carries with it a divide in opinions about who should and shouldn't be tattooed. With a majority of anyone over 50 uncomfortable with the idea of teachers having visible tattoos, but far more comfortable with chefs. In fact, among millennials, based on these data, I'd assume that they don't trust a chef without a tattoo. Looking at these data, we can see that in America, we have changing ideas about tattooing. We're right now negotiating, when are they appropriate? Who should have tattoos? Who shouldn't? And what do tattoos mean? And this is why the study of ancient tattooing is so relevant right now. It gives us a new backdrop to debate and understand where our modern notions of tattooing come from and what this practice meant to past peoples. So my hope for you today is that regardless of how you currently understand tattoos, you'll walk away in an hour with a new understanding of this ancient practice. And let me tell you what a time to study ancient tattooing. So we are now basically in the golden age for finding evidence of tattooing in archeological contexts. This graph shows all original publications of human remains from archeological contexts with tattoos worldwide. We're starting from 1875 and moving in 25 year intervals to the present. And what you can see is there has basically been an explosion of new evidence around tattooing in the past in the 21st century. <clears throat> in fact, there are more publications worldwide in the past 10 years than the entire 20th century combined. New techniques like near infrared photography and multispectral imaging, as well as image enhancement software have made it far easier for us to find tattoos. But this divide is not only technological. We've just seen a major generational shift in ideas about tattooing. So what we're going to do right now is look at the evidence and ideas about ancient Egyptian tattooing in the 20th century and see how they've changed in recent years. Now in this presentation, we're going to be talking about the evidence we use to identify and understand tattoos in ancient Egypt. And I want to start with just pointing out that tattoos are an incredibly difficult topic to tackle in many ancient places, especially Egypt. Hieroglyphic texts simply do not describe the practice. I know of no unambiguous textual descriptions of someone getting a tattoo or a word we could translate as tattoo. The closest thing we have to this is this verb metin, which is used in papyrus, Bremner Rhine, but in that context, it clearly talks about metinu, about inscribing ink into the body of a waxen figure, not necessarily human skin. The archeology span of tattooing, the idea of finding materials like ink and tools is literally like looking for a needle in a 3000 year old village. Even when we find this evidence, it can be difficult to know 
if it was used for tattooing or many other purposes. This bundle of copper needles from Kafar Hassan Dawood exemplifies one possible tattoo toolkit, but we really don't have enough concrete evidence to say that a bundle of needer, needles such as this was used for tattooing. The artistic depictions seen here are some of the few that we have argued are evidence of tattooing from an artistic viewpoint. But when we look at figurines, art on walls and other depictions, it can be difficult to know when we see a tattoo. When we see a mark on skin, when should we differentiate a permanent tattoo from henna or jewelry? When should it simply be an adornment for the object rather than something that was on human mummified remains? So really our only concrete avenue for the study of tattooing in ancient Egypt is through the study of human remains, which is why today I'm here to show you what tattooing looked like in ancient Egypt. And that requires we consider evidence both from photographs of human remains and drawings that are derived from those photos. So for the rest of this presentation, I'm gonna really focus on what, what our evidence from human remains tells us, and then reconnecting that evidence to what we can see in art in other avenues. Now, if we look at the earliest evidence we have for mummified remains with tattoos from Egypt, we will find three women that were found near the temple of Neb Hepet Re, Mentu Hotep, the second during excavations in 1891 and 1922. These women were buried in a royal mortuary complex and they were recently revisited by Catherine Rorig in her 2015 publication, Two Tattooed Women from Thebes. Their burials included high value grave goods, such as the objects pictured here, including a Za amulet made of electrum, which is a mix of uh, silver and gold. The woman you see to the left was found with a coffin. She was named Amunath in the coffin, and she had titles like priestess of Hathor and sole ornament of the king, or more recently revised title of lady in waiting. Her tattoos are similar to those that you see in the two women drawn on the right. They all had these geometric motifs that were placed along their chest, thighs, abdomen, and or arms. And while plentiful, these tattoos had been difficult to understand. Their geometric patterning obscured their symbolic meaning. Soon after these discoveries, uh, Firth identified tattoos on the abdomen of a woman from a Nubian cemetery. And he indicated that her burial included a quantity of white shell beads threaded on a leather thong. And he notes that the pattern dots look similar to those found on previously excavated wooden dolls. So when we look at the evidence that we have from these different sources, uh, what we see is that as we look at the scholarship, they pull out some of the themes that we've just seen, but they actually have many ideas about the functions of these tattoos and tattooed women that rarely show a close consideration of the evidence I just presented. Scholars suggested that tattooed women must have all been dancers, concubines, and sex workers. Their tattoos were interpreted as primarily decorative, functioning to provoke caramel desire from a male gaze. These interpretations suggest that tattoos were perceived as both advertising and manifesting erotic desire. And importantly, these early hypotheses around the functions of tattoos often divorced any of these ideas around eroticism from fertility from motherhood, from the family. So for example, Herbert Winlock described the fat figurine you see in the upper right-hand corner as, quote, a little fans dancing girl clad in a cowrie shell girdle and tattooing to amuse him, the tomb owner, after the hunt. Louis Keimer, who wrote the book on tattooing, the only book we have uh, currently on tattooing in ancient Egypt, said that in translation, that all the women tattooed by dots or strokes whose mummies or representations Egyptian antiquity bequeathed us were women of questionable morality. And of the mummified women I just showed you, he said, quote, to be attached to some divine service, they were nonetheless streetwalkers. Adding, 
I would add that I do not know of any example going back to ancient Egypt of a woman of good society adorned with tattoos. Keimer's disdain for these tattooed women is palpable in these quotes. He goes on to mock Bernard Briere, who, uh, who spoke about tattooing and the possibility that tattooing is linked to family. And he says that Briere was doing essentially, uh, he says, quote, the impossible to save the honor of tattooed ladies, and then even uses sarcasm quotes around ladies to imply that clearly they could not be of uh, uh, ladies of good morality, essentially. He basically says that even if these women were mothers, it was almost by default of their connection with sex work. And really goes further to ignore evidence that shows that some of the examples of tattooing in figurines or art could be connected to fertility. In 1993, Ogden Gallet wrote that tattooing was, quote, a practice limited to servants and the lower classes. Now, I cannot emphasize strongly enough how these interpretations of tattooing in ancient Egypt willfully ignore the actual evidence that's been uncovered so far. First, we actually do not have evidence for women as sex workers in ancient Egypt prior to Greek rule. And it's not to say that sex work didn't exist, but it makes it clear that Keimer and others did not get the idea that tattooed women were sex workers from ancient Egyptian art, text, or archaeology. Second, the argument that tattooing belonged to poor women or servants ignores the fact that only three tattooed women we have come from a royal burial ground with titles limited to the upper echelons of Egyptian society and expensive grave goods. Third, these authors only acknowledge the location of the tattoos when they elicit an erotic connotation. But looking at this image in the bottom right hand corner of the priestess and Munitz tattoos, should we really think that the tattoos encircling her abdomen functioned solely to sexually arouse a king in death, rather than to enhance her own fertility and pregnancy in life. When we look at these ideas about ancient Egyptian tattooing in the 20th century, it's obvious they're not coming from the existing evidence. So where did these ideas about prostitution, morality, class, and tattooing come from? Well, I want to just first point out that while I presented this as a 20th century phenomenon, what we see is that we have more recent scholarship that still exhibits much of the narrative generated during the 20th century. Each of these quotes that come from more recent scholars, including one from 2020, basically suggests that tattooing is linked to morality, to carnal beauty, uh, to, to arouse the primitive sexual instincts of the male tomb owners. And so these ideas, while originating from earlier scholarship, are certainly something I see pervasive in academic scholars today. And when I look at their origins, what I see is shifting perceptions that are actually coming from American and European ideas and stereotypes about tattooing which tended to eroticize and exoticize women's tattoos. Tattoo historians suggest one of the origins of this is Olive Oatman, whose family joined the broader movements of westward expansion in 1850 in the U.S. En route from St. Louis, actually, where I am today, to the West, Olive and her sister were abducted and kept in captivity, first by the Yavapai and then the Mojave. All of her sister were both marked with blue tattoos on their chins, which you can see in the upper left-hand image. And her story was quickly popularized and it led to other tall tales of women and tattooing intermingled with westward expansion. Irene Woodward, pictured here in the center, for example, made up a story that she grew up in a small cabin in the West where her father tattooed her and liking it so much, she had him tattoo her whole body. She went on to be one of the earliest tattooed exhibitions performing all over the U.S. and Europe, people paying to see her body. Her story and many others adopted these similar themes that keyed in on 
American and European fascination with the American West as this exotic and untamed place. This trend continued for decades. Brody, Betty Broadbent, pictured here in the upper right-hand corner with over 400 tattoos, performed for Barnum and Bailey, and tattooed women became a common show in circus performances. Margaret Mifflin, who wrote a book looking at this history of tattoos and women said, quote, the women afforded a peep show along with a freak show because at that time, women just didn't show that much skin publicly. The tattoos gave them a reason to strip down and show their bodies. Certainly a number of people who came to see them were interested in the flesh as much as the art, end quote. Indeed, these poor performances uh, these performances not only exemplified what the women uh, were per being perceived as objects of this erotic gaze, but they also turned them into something that could be commodified through these tickets that people would buy and, and then consumed. Now, I can even see semblances of this today. These social stigmas have certainly evolved, as we already saw uh, over the years, with new generational ideas about tattooing but we still have remnants of them. One of, my, one of the most visible ways we see this is the quote unquote tramp stamp used to describe tattoos on the lower back of women, which were seen only as allowable and seemly if they're found on young and attractive women. The American TV show Saturday Night Live even poked fun at the tramp stamp with their skit on Turlington's lower back tattoo remover featuring a 32 year old Amy Poehler. It says in the skit that, quote, these tattoos are one of the best things a young woman could do to be cool. And you ladies were cool. But now look at you. Let's face it. You're not young anymore. You're not even close. That's why you need Turlington's lower back tattoo remover. End quote. Actually, um, in preparing for this presentation, I was scrolling through social media. And just last week, I saw that Teen Vogue came out with an article titled Reclaiming Tramp Stamp Tattoos, How Ashamed 2000s staple became a sign of resilience for Gen Z, in which they use some of the research I'm about to show you to talk about reclaiming lower back tattoos. So when we reflect on the ideas proposed by Keimer and other early 20th century scholars on tattooing in ancient Egypt, and how those even extend today, what we can see is that while their ideas weren't well rooted in historical evidence, they certainly reflect their own social context. Their perceptions of Egyptian women's tattooed bodies is not only erotic, but also consumable for the male tomb owner, either as a figurine or as a person, align with these broader trends in European and American interpretations of tattoos during this time. This takes ancient Egypt out of its context and distorts the past by projecting modern ideas prevalent in the United States and Europe onto ancient Egyptians. Instead, we should be asking, what can we learn by studying ancient Egyptian tattoos in their own context? And my point isn't to eradicate the possibility that these tattoos could have erotic undertones, but rather point out that we need to base that from Egyptian sources and not modern ones. So with that, we're gonna turn to our newest evidence because as we just saw worldwide, we have this explosion of research on tattooing and this is true in Egypt as well. This slide shows current published examples of tattoos from ancient Egypt to date. Everything with a red arrow has been published since 2000, with the majority of these coming out in the past 10 years. Now, most of the evidence for tattooing prior to recent years came from Nubian cemeteries, and many scholars also assumed that the mummified human remains I just showed you may have been Nubian rather than Egyptian. But three discoveries have been made by colleagues working in pharaonic graves, and these really rewrite what we've seen so far about tattooing in ancient Egypt. And I'll begin with Ellen Morris, who came out with an article in 2011, looking at the so-called paddle dolls, what you see on the right-hand side of this slide. She found going through the archives of Metropolitan Museum, the tattoo on mummified remains of a woman that had not been previously published. And what she noted is that it had the same motifs, these bird motifs, as the paddle doll you see on the right, which shows them on the thighs. 
through linking multiple lines of evidence found in local tomb scenes, Egyptian mythology, mummified human remains, these tattooed figurines and paddle dolls. She argued that tattooed women acted as Kenner dancers who danced for Hathor, but also as, as Hathor by revealing their bodies to the sun. This references this ancient Egyptian myth of the contendings of Horus and Seth where the goddess does just that and argues that they harness their sexuality to rebirth the king as important and key cultic performers. They basically embody the goddess to rejuvenate a king. Morris argues her dancers. She even argues some of these erotic elements, but she bases this on these various lines of evidence from ancient Egypt. And in this case, their dancing isn't meant solely to pleasure a tomb owner or the king, but instead as key members of the cult of Hathor, dancing and performing for the divine, even as the divine. She leaves interpretation to how the tattoos were functioning, but this was really the first figural tattoo mentioned. However, it's really a lone example. So after this, we also had a publication that really helped reset our narrative around tattooing by Renee Friedman and colleagues. She discovered and published tattoos on two mummified remains from the British Museum. One was found on this individual, Gebelin Man A. He's a pre-dynastic man that's been on uh, uh, in the museum's um, visible area for years. She's, he's basically seen by millions of visitors each year. Yet his tattoos were invisible until Rene Friedman published them in infrared. So this just shows how much new technology is giving us access to tattoos that have been actually in plain sight all this time. They found tattoos on these two different individuals that showed uh, other figural components like a bull, Barbary sheep. And when she looked at these tattoos, it gave us some really exciting new ideas because it pushed back tattooing in Egypt thousands of years. And it pointed to a tradition that existed in some of the earliest phases of what we describe as ancient Egyptian civilization. And it suggests a tradition must have existed within Egypt early on and not been exclusively imported from ancient Nubia. Equally importantly, this example is a tattoo on a man. It's the only example of a tattoo on a man you'll see in this entire presentation. In fact, the title of this presentation is Discovering the Tattooed Women. So it breaks that gender barrier and brings up the idea that tattooing likely shifted in its norms across this huge, vast period of Egyptian civilization. Now, this brings us to the evidence that I have found in my research at the site of Daryl Medina. Daryl Medina is pictured in my background. It's the village of the workmen who cut and decorated the royal tombs in Egypt during its new kingdom period. This village belonged to a group of, of semi-elite individuals. They had hard labor that they had to do, but they were still afforded many different social and economic opportunities than the average Egyptian. I am the bioarchaeologist for the research of the Institut Francais d'Archéologie Orientale, the French Institute of Oriental Archaeology. And so working on their mission, I was looking at human remains for my original research focused on health and healthcare. And as I was doing that, I came across the mummified remains of this woman. We just have her torso. You can see her hands, her thighs were not actually present. That's why they're shown in gray. We don't have her head. But as you can also see from this image that she was heavily tattooed. She had over 30 tattoos, most of which were placed in public and highly visible areas of her body. Her figural tattoos included paired divine eyes placed at the neck, shoulders, and back, which meant however you looked at her, there was a pair of divine eyes looking back at you. They were also often constructed using this ear nefer formula which in ancient Egyptian, the verb irinefer means to do good. And by having uh, it written with both eyes in this symbol for good, nefer, in the center to represent the nose, you can read it from the center out in both directions. So to do good, to do good. And in 
cases on the tops of her shoulders, you can see she actually has three nefer signs, neferu, which is, uh, you know, when you pluralize and you make it three, it's to do the best, essentially. These are pictured with uh, wajit eyes, a divine eye, which even connotes this divine ability to do good. We see other examples of tattoos that are connected as well with H Hathor. So for example, moving down her arm, we have these tattoos placed on her uh, elbow of two Hathoric cows standing opposite each other, wearing menat necklaces, which is a necklace uh, specifically for that goddess. But we also had many tattoos that were hard to interpret. So for example, we have these unusual cross-like patterns shown on the upper arm that we still today don't know what they depict. And yet we found at Daryl Medina, previous evidence of women with these crosses on their arms in a tomb scene. <clears throat> This just shows you that this process of discovering and publishing and studying these tattoos is ongoing even with individuals that we've looked at extensively. In addition to those Hathoric cows that I just showed you, we also found tattoos that on their own are hard to interpret, but when we put them in the context at Daryl Medina, show other connections to this goddess. For example, some of these symbols on her back also appear as graffiti, on the floor of the temple for Hathor at Daryl Medina. <clears throat> Over, our overall interpretation of these tattoos were that they showed clear connection between her body and divine images, objects, temple spaces of Hathor. They also included symbols that could act as protections, as divine enhancers for her to do good. We offered multiple roles for this woman in the community for which these protections and enhancements may benefit. For example, a healer or a wise woman. And it's interesting because even though she has so many tattoos connecting her with the goddess Hathor, it occurs in a period where women were not given the title priestess of Hathor anymore. Where scholars had previously suggested that menstruation and childbirth rendered women's bodies too impure for that role, these Hathoric tattoos placed publicly and permanently on, these on this woman's body meant that her body was unremittingly associated with this goddess, that it even transcended this need to be pure because she was always connected to the goddess regardless of the state her of purity her body was in, regardless of her cleaning, regardless of menstruation, et cetera. So with these new data come new conclusions and our most recent evidence has suggested that there was a plurality of functions that tattoos likely held in ancient Egypt, including acting as social identity markers, as participants in cult practice, as magical protections, and even as divine enhancers. We can see that this more recent research has broken down this notion that tattoos are exclusively for an erotic gaze. And what I also noticed about recent scholarship is that they allow for us to think about tattoos in multiple ways, not as just having one function, but many, whether it's as this divine enhancer or an ethnic marker or understanding them in some of the ways I'll mention in a moment. So this is just one of our discoveries at Daryl Medina, but as you heard before the talk, We've actually found many more. And so I want to bring you to the work we're doing. This is the bioarchaeology team from 2022. And in our work, we're not looking exclusively for tattoos. We're actually looking at all the human remains and how to better their conservation at the site. And as we're doing this work, we of course check to see whether tattoos were present. And lo and behold, this one woman, is not the only one with tattoos. We have found tattoo after tattoo after tattoo after tattoo. And this last slide, I think, really shows you why some of the times when I'm finding these tattoos, maybe they're pre present in other sites and we're just figuring out how to look for them. Because I'm hoping right now you're looking very closely at the bottom right-hand corner of the screen and confused because I'm telling you there are tattoos present, but as you look, maybe you're wondering, 
Am I just seeing the skin? Am I seeing folds? Is it broken? What am I supposed to see? So now let me show you the same individual, but in infrared. And suddenly, magically, you can see this beautiful and enormous tattoo motif on the lower black of this woman. So what we're discovering is in part because we work at a place with amazing preservation and opportunities to identify tattoos, but also the power of new technology in revealing these tattoos that have not been seen for thousands of years. Now, through these examples, we can ask questions like, where do we find tattoos? When and to whom are these visible? How is imagery linked to location, to age, to sex or gender? And in this slide, you can see the red is the areas that we just saw of that first heavily tattooed woman, but in blue are all of the new areas where we've identified tattoos. And you can see how the lower back, that area we so typically use to describe a tramp stamp, is actually an area where we have lots of evidence of tattooing coming out of the human remains. We also can ask about what symbolism and motifs are there. How common are they? What's unique? What's missing? And this is where we get new ways to understand how tattoos function in ancient Egypt. So for example, here we see an image of the god Bess. Now I show you side by side a tattoo that's found on the hip of a woman with a drawing of an ostracon from Daryl Medina. In both cases, the god has his bent arms and bent legs, but his head is broken and he's standing next to a cone of fat. Now I'll describe this in more depth in a little bit, but what's interesting is we can then connect these tattoos with the evidence that we're getting in artistic depictions. So that photo we looked at at the very beginning of our presentation is from a house at Daryl Medina. And if we zoom in, you can see images of the god Bess here placed on the thighs of a woman from that household. So this gives us the concrete opportunity to say that in this case, when we see these images, we probably are looking at actual tattoos rather than other ways of adorning the body, rather than henna or jewelry or something that's just meant to be shown in the art rather than on skin. <laughs> We can also start to ask when we see tattoos in art and when we don't to better understand Egyptian ideas about when, where, and why tattoos should be shown. It's interesting to see this example from Daryl Medina showing a geometric style tattoo of a triangle made out of dots on the thigh of this woman performing an acrobatic dance at Daryl Medina. And this ostracon, which very similarly shows a woman, but without the tattoo. So in my research, as I'm finding tattoos, I'm asking myself, do I find other things like, for instance, age barriers to who and who gets a tattoo and who doesn't, or these gender barriers that we've seen so far? And so I want to bring you into our, our most recent research to finish the talk by demonstrating how we're actually putting this into practice and linking evidence from human remains as well as artistic depictions of tattoos to understand what they can tell us about ancient Egyptian ideas about tattooing. So I've just shown you a couple of examples and we saw this one when I revealed the infrared photo of tattoos. You can see it has uh, ibex on either hip eating a floral bouquet between which we have a water symbol that aligns across the body. And then we have wajit eyes, these divine eyes that we've reconstructed on the right and found evidence for on the left, placed above that wavy, watery line. Interestingly, when we look at artistic depictions, we have this amazing, beautiful wooden spoon, currently in the Pushkin Museum, that shows a very similar motif. Here we have the ibex on either side. This tattoo is in the lower back. We have a line that can be representing that kind of watery, marshy context with plants coming up out of it. We have that image of the god Bess that I just showed you reconstructed here, standing next to the cone of fat. And when we look at 
other placements of the tattoos, you can see many different contexts where the lower back is chosen. For instance, in these figurines studied by my colleague, Marylise Arnett, we see this fascinating connection between tattooing and motherhood and fertility. So these figurines are interesting because they are hand modeled rather than made out of a mold so that they could be reproduced over and over and over again. They have tattoo symbols that look to be in the same areas of the body. So that lower back where you see on the one example in the bottom center, a marshy environment, we see the uh, wavy line on the left. And you can see also that these are given this very elongated abdomen that appears to be pregnant. They're some of the few examples we have of artistic depictions of pregnancy in ancient Egypt. So when we put these together, what we see is that these variety of shared motifs that we see in tattooed human remains in figurines have a unifying element, which is the women's multiple roles in the birth process. The ibex was elsewhere used in the New Kingdom as this signifier of unbridled sexual desire and carried with it erotic undertones. So beginning with sex, tattoos are connected with imagery associated with women as erotically charged beings through this association with the ibex. Tattoos are also depicted uh, on pregnant women through these molded pregnant figurines and their placement on the lower back and their symbolism, which often includes marshy and watery images, may have also connected them to the goddess Hathor who's known for her connections to the marsh. Common tattoo motifs depict divine beings that protect women and children in childbirth, including Hathor and the god Bess. And within this, they are connected with women in divine service for Hathor, like this priestess from the Middle Kingdom, or like the example of the woman that I just showed you who's heavily tattooed. These women may have been empowered not only in their own successful childbirth, but in the success of their sisters, their friends, their daughters as midwives. Tattoos are also associated with the rituals of postpartum, ensuring that mother and child survive the tenuous period soon after birth. The same imagery used in this tattoo is used in the rituals that women underwent during postpartum to ensure their safety. So this period of post-birth and postpartum, um, this basically two week period of protection is a time where women are vulnerable to infection, where they have to start breastfeeding and ensure that breastfeeding is successful. And so there is a lot of threats to health for both mother and child. And during this time, we have evidence from our site that women would receive gifts and protections and those include not only this imagery of the god Bess, but also the cone of fat that's placed next to him in the tattoo that I showed above and now even more completely below. Of course, whenever you publish something, of course, you have to find something afterwards. So after publishing evidence of that tattoo that you see of the god Bess, I found the rest of the motif across her body. And when we look at this reconstruction, I show you um, from her left hip all the way to the right hip, we see Bess from corner to corner. And what you can see in the upper right-hand side of this tattoo is what I argue is a birth arbor. These are shown at Daryl Medina for women who've given birth. You can see a woman breastfeeding here and we're part of that postpartum ritual. In combination through location, symbolism and shared motifs, tattooing connected to women's multiple roles in the birth process as lovers, as being pregnant, as midwives or new mothers. These recent discoveries have continually rewritten our understanding of tattooing in ancient Egypt. And as our corpus expands, so too should our understanding of the functionality of tattoos. With new evidence should also come new interpretation. And it's with this perspective that I look forward to January when I'll return to Daryl Medina for the 2024 field season and the discoveries it'll reveal. Thank you for listening and many thanks to the organizations and people that made this research possible.
Thank you so much, Dr. Austin. Look at all the love coming through. Um, this is fantastic. And there's there's been a lively chat, but if you have questions, please put them in the Q&A. Um, thank you for such a wonderful, wonderful and engaging talk. Um, uh, we've got about 15 minutes for questions. I will try to get through as many of them as I can. And so um, there is a, to begin with, there's a group of questions that's about what these tattoos actually are. So what kind of ink is used? Could it be henna? Um, how would you determine the difference? Um, uh, what was the ink made of? I said that, yes. Um, uh, and related to that on preservation, um, why is it that uh, you can see only some of them with infrared light? Um, uh, is these are all great questions. Yeah. yeah, and these actually do work together really well. So when we ask this question of what ink were they made of, I wish I had an easy answer. The reality is that right now we'll only do non-destructive testing. And the non-destructive testing that we could do uh, which would be, for example, portable x-ray fluorescence is not going to be as useful as we'd like for differentiating what I imagine the tattoo ink might be, which is carbon, um, a charcoal-based tattoo ink from the surrounding skin. So when we look at the kind of ink that Egyptians used in their texts in other places, they're using a, a charcoal-based ink, a carbon-based ink. Um, so that's what I anticipate. If we look at many societies worldwide, black tattoos are usually using that as the medium, but there's often things added to it that even with a chemical signature, we might not see. So for instance, other body liquids get added, breast milk, uh, spit, is, is a way to provide in some ways like a magical protection or some added function to this ink. And that's something we won't find. So I have lots of ideas, but not great answers to, to explain that. Why some are more visible with infrared versus others, which you saw very clearly with the naked eye, is in part because of that mummification process. So particularly the woman with the dirty tattoos, the ones on her front were really visible. But because of the fact that she was lying down after she died, during that mummification process, which for her appeared to actually be quite simple. It didn't have a lot of extra steps to it, but the body fluids tend to go to the back when they're lying down. And so her skin has a lot of discoloration from that process. What the infrared does is because it has a longer wavelength than visible light, it actually gets a little bit below that edge of the skin and it reflects differently from the black ink than from the surrounding skin. So it's been incredibly useful to pick out and identify tattoos in cases where the mummification has changed the skin color. Thank you. Thank you for this. Okay, the next set of questions is sort of around the who gets tattooed and when. So um, you showed one male, if I remember correctly, with the tattoo, does this, is there evidence for more men with this new evidence? And then were children ever tattooed? And was anyone ever tattooed post-mortem? And would you be able to tell that? So when we look at the evidence so far, we've seen a lot during the Middle Kingdom and New Kingdom just focused on women. We know as well that Egypt is an interaction with its neighbors. So for instance, in depictions of ancient Libyans, we see them and men particularly wearing tattoos during the same period. Uh, so there's probably more going on when we look in a bigger context. In ancient Nubia, we'll find both men and women with tattoos. And since these people are all interacting and sharing both uh, their DNA and their culture, it's possible that we are gonna find more evidence. And I'm looking and we have some, some potential stuff that's happening, but nothing that I'm gonna say is for sure. When we look at um, the pre-dynastic, the example I showed that of a man from the pre-dynastic period, we see a different tradition. So it suggests that tattooing changed but this is over a huge period of time. So we're talking well over a thousand years between that pre-dynastic man and the women that I showed you from Daryl Medina, or even some of the Middle Kingdom examples that we saw as well. In terms of the age and demographics, we have not found any tattoos on children. All the tattoos I've identified where I can tell the age are on adults. And many of these women, uh, you know, it's hard in 
when I only have part of a human of human remains, only part of a body, I can't give you the precise ages, but all of these women are at least uh, 20 from the ones that I have better preservation for and likely well over that. Of course, that doesn't tell us when they received their tattoos. So this heavily tattooed woman with over 30 tattoos has tattoos placed all over her body with different preservation of the tattoos. And what I see when I look at the edges is that some of them are really diffuse, which is what happens if you've had a tattoo for a long time, the ink diffuses in your skin as your skin continuously grows and changes. So that suggests that she had her tattoos for a while. It suggests that she received some at one period and others at another period. And that also helps us differentiate a tattoo from a temporary marking like henna. Thank you. Okay, the next, um, we're getting more and more questions. So I'm trying to group them all together. The next set of questions is about the what is tattooed on them. So you've shown us some of these images, some of these geometric images um, and offer some interpretations. Um, the um, people, folks joining us in this talk also wanna know, um, is there ever writing? Um, if you have bones that are tattooed, could it be because of arthritis or something like that? Like are ailments right. ever documented? Um, then also, uh, um, who was performing the tattooing? Do we know? And and um, how would you differentiate a tattoo needle from sewing needle? Sorry, these are oh, kind of a lot so of many questions. good questions. No, these are all great questions. Um, and so I'll miss half of them, but I'll try and get back to them. So I'll start with the last one because it's most recent in my mind. The the telling these tools apart can be really difficult. I have colleagues who've done this in North America. So if you're interested in learning about tattoo tools. I would check out some of the work by Aaron Dieter Wolf. And he has looked at um, basically the breakage patterns that you can have with different types of objects that may have been used for tattooing. And then looking to see, do we have the same breakage patterns in an archeological context? Do we have the same um, depth of the deposition of ink if we found ink at the tip of these tools? So there are things you can do, but those are, you know, provided you find an object that is well-preserved, that is um, something that had been used. For instance, in burial, sometimes you bury things, people with new things, like a new set of tattoo tools. So it's very difficult. And we, as I mentioned, we don't have this textual descriptions. We don't have artistic de descriptions uh, or depictions of tattooing. So it's something that's a future avenue, but it's still a huge question mark. As for the other questions that came up around the imagery of the tattoos, will you remind me of the other three questions? Yeah, so, so there are actually, I forgot a couple. So there, there, is there ever writing? Oh, writing, could, right. Could um, tattoos denote some sort of an ailment and or mm -hmm. cover stretch marks? Um, and so, yeah, so, so those. Yeah. So those are great. So writing that ear and effort formula, I showed the do good formula is basically the most writing we get. And it's interesting because when we look at uh, writing in ancient Egypt, the village that I study has women, has documents that are authored and sent to women. And there's debate over whether those women actually wrote them or whether they dictated them. I'm actually in this, the camp that they wrote them. So they, women were in that case literate, but actually the vast majority of women weren't literate. And so it's interesting, right? To see that this is a very gendered tradition but also that literacy is a gender tradition. And in this case, we have writing on the body, but it does not match the writing we would have on papyrus. So I think it's a, it's almost like a different kind of language. We do have individual hieroglyphs that I showed or pairs of hieroglyphs, but instead most of the imagery that I've identified so far focuses on naturalistic imagery. So animals and plants that were important in Egyptian ideology. So I think that might tell us a bit whether or not they had a medical purpose, the ones in the lower back that show that watery sign, um, what's interesting is if I look at the medical texts and read them, what I've seen is that when they talk about women's gynecology, they talk about the pains of parturition and some of the things that show up specifically for women's health. One of the treatments is to put cooling waters on the back. So we suggested that might be one of the reasons that that location has these watery images as well. But we otherwise haven't identified tattoos connected to arthritis, other ailments. I'll tell you as a bioarchaeologist, very few ailments that we experience show up in bone because so much is in soft tissue. 
So it's hard to know whether that was a, something that was practiced that we just aren't seeing in the human remains. Great, thank you so much. Um, next is sort of a regional question um, and are, there are a few of these and these broadly um, people want to know like, could this be a phenomenon that's really localized? Yeah, is this just this crazy artistic community that's like out there and kind of, you know, this, this hippie tattooed group um, in comparison to other average Egyptian towns? I think it's possible. We do have more evidence, not just in human remains, but these artistic depictions than we find at least during this period in other sites in Egypt. But as you also saw, this process of looking for the tattoos is just as important. So prior to this work, we didn't know that any of the women or any people at Daryl Medina at all had tattoos. We didn't have any evidence from human remains. And yet, as soon as we started looking, we kept finding that evidence. So I think that there's a lot of opportunity. I think we are at the tip of this iceberg. And the question is, um, yeah, maybe Daryl Medina is unusual in the quantity of tattoos, but I think there will be other places where this tradition existed, especially because those middle kingdom tattoos I showed, those three women at the beginning of the talk, they date hundreds of years earlier, but the same region. So it's quite possible that if it is a regional phenomenon, it's something that's been around well before this village was established. Great. Then there was also a question about chronology. Um, do these date to, do you get tattoos only for a certain period of time in ancient Egypt or is it all throughout? Essentially our evidence is uh, sparse, but over different periods. So the example I showed of the man with tattoo, which another woman was found with him, is from the pre-dynastic period, so the beginnings of Egyptian civilization. We go forward in Egyptian time, we go to the Old Kingdom, we don't see evidence, but that is also a time where we don't have great skin preservation. So it's hard to know if that evidence is missing because of that, uh, because of preservation or because the practice went out of favor. In the Middle Kingdom, we then start to see evidence appearing more and more in the region that we're looking at, and that seems to continue into the New Kingdom, which is when I study Egyptian culture. If we go beyond that, when we start seeing e Egyptians interact with other cultures, we get interesting changes in tattooing. And of course, you uh, could look at the Coptic period, and even today, tattooing is an important tradition that many Copts practice, and uh, a depiction of a cross on the front of the wrist is one place where we often find Coptic style tattoos. And some of the earliest Coptic human remains at the British Museum that they've looked at have identified tattoos um, there too. So we find that it goes in and out and it might be partially because the, the actual practice changes and it might be partially because our evidence is just not great in some periods. Thank you very much. There are still just increasing questions in the chat and I apologize profusely that I'm not gonna be able to get to all of them. Um, I, I should let you know that there are several, even though you've already answered this question that we don't really know who did the tattooing, that there are several theories in the chat that women are tattooing other women. Um, yeah, I mean, when we look at anthropological research by Lars Krutak on modern tattooing and gendered practices, Krutak has found that when women are have their own tattooing tradition, they're being tattooed by women. So I think that's fascinating. And you know, these are things that show us that this work has a lot of new directions that we can go in the future. Um, I'll do just do one final question because it's been mentioned a couple of times. It's been highlighted a couple of times by different people. Um, Jennifer Higgitus wants to know, in the tomb of Queen Nefertari in the Valley of the Queens, at the rear of the tomb in the burial chamber, there are I believe two reliefs of the queen with what has been called tattoos on her arm. Are you familiar yeah. with those? And do, you, do you agree that those are tattoos? So I haven't been since I've heard this and I haven't had a look. What can be tricky when you look at these is that there's often depictions on the arm that show essentially jewelry. And so a wadget eye often appears, but the dotted lines around it are not always as clear. So I think this is a good question that I don't want to make a definitive claim about, but I, what it also shows is that we give markings on the skin that we often didn't interpret as tattoos. And now that we realize people were getting them, we start to ask, were these tattoos? Uh, 
parallel to that is that we know um, men, Egyptian kings often have their cartouches that are physically chiseled into their skin and their statuary. The assumption is never that that's been tattoos. I'm not arguing that they are, but it's another example where we suddenly say, oh, wait, what, what does it mean when something's inscribed into skin? And this is where that multidisciplinary research, the integration of human remains becomes so important for this study. Alas, thank you. We have reached the end of the archeology span hour. There are, I apologize again profusely to all the folks whose questions I didn't get to. Um, I wanna thank Dr. Austin again for a really well attended and completely fascinating and engaging talk. So, and thanks to all of you who came, please join the AIA, um, join your local chapter and tune in for the next archeology span hour. Thank you, Dr. Austin. Bye, thank you all for joining.